How's it going guys? So this is my fourth microbiology presentation here on YouTube and similar to the other ones, this is not going to be a two hour discussion where we talk about every little detail about every little organism. The point here is strictly to discuss what will show up in questions, what's going to increase your score on the USMLE. That's it, okay? We're not going to make this a waste of time. So before we get started, I will be my typical asshole, tell you to subscribe to my channel. I really appreciate it. Hit the like button. Hit the bell if you want notifications. Find me on Instagram at melman underscore medical. M-E-H-L-M-A-N underscore medical. Link is down below. Find me on Telegram. Recently created a Telegram group and channel. Links are down below. Now, let's start the fucking presentation here where I created a couple of algorithms for some of the gram negatives. I will discuss roughly two to three times the number of organisms in this presentation, but it can be helpful for your retention to have some visual representation of some of the organisms. So by all means, you could pause this slide if you wish, but we are going to move forward now. So Haemophilus influenza, you need to know the difference between regular, quote unquote, non-typable Haemophilus influenza and Haemophilus influenza type B. Haemophilus influenza type B has a polysaccharide capsule that we can vaccinate against. So patients who have splenectomy or autosplenectomy in sickle cell, we vaccinate against Hib, Haemophilus influenza type B, Neisseri meningitis, strep pneumo. Hib can cause epiglottitis, thumbprint sign, medical emergency, need to intubate. It can also cause meningitis, classically immigrant status, the implication being uh, no vaccination history. Whereas regular non-typable Haemophilus influenza can cause otitis media, it's a common cause, as with strep pneumo, and Haemophilus influenza, non-typable, can also cause uh, pneumonia in COPD. Now, Legionella it causes an atypical pneumonia. Uh, buzzy descriptors in the questions will mention business meetings, uh, air conditioners, conferences. Okay, it's contracted via aerosol. And some classic ways to distinguish it from other causes of pneumonia is that uh, Legionella can cause hyponatremia and diarrhea, okay? And we can diagnose with a urinary antigen test. Bordetella pertussis, that's our whooping cough. USMLE can describe this as several successive coughs, uh, followed by an inspiratory strider. Post-tussive means after the cough. Post-tussive emesis, vomiting, and hypoglycemia are two uh, descriptors that can show up in pertussis questions. It's not that they're necessarily specific for pertussis, it's just that I've noticed in NBME questions that post-tussive emesis and hypoglycemia uh, can occur with pertussis. And you need to know it's not just, it's not limited to pediatrics. They can give you a 19-year-old who has coughs, strider, post-tussive vomiting, and hypoglycemia, that's your pertussis. And for step one, they do want you to be aware of the toxin, which inhibits G-alpha-I, G-protein. If you agonize G-alpha-I, that causes a decrease in CAMP. So if we inhibit G-alpha-I via pertussis toxin, we increase CAMP. Okay? It's stupid, but it's what USMLE wants you to know. Francisella tularensis, you just need to know this is an atypical pneumonia that can occur due to rabbits. And it can... Also, it's known to cause painless black skin lesions. Don't confuse this with the black eschar with surrounding edema that you get due to cutaneous anthrax. Brucella, it causes a condition called undulant fever, okay, like an oscillatory fever, and the association is unpasteurized milk slash goat products. So for instance, the same way you just said Okay, well, Francisella tularensis, that's the pneumonia with rabbits. You can say, oh, Brucella, that's the one with uh, goat products, unpasteurized milk, and it can cause undulant fever. It can also cause neurobrucellosis. Barnella hensile, very high yield for USMLE. Uh, cat scratch disease. Okay, USMLE is often not so easy where they're literally going to say, kid was scratched by a cat, has an infection, what's the organism? Okay, it's too easy. What they might do is actually tell you there's a seven-year-old girl, she's got a papule on her finger, and you might be thinking, OMG, sporotrichosis. Relax, because if they say granulomata are visualized uh, on silver stain, 
They're talking about Bartonella Hensley, okay? So they can make it a difficult question. Now, this is a detail some students tend to like, which is uh, Bartonella Hensley in immunocompromised patients can cause a Kaposi sarcoma-like presentation, uh, violaceous nodules on the body that resembles, uh, as I just said, Kaposi sarcoma, but uh, Kaposi sarcoma is due to HHV-8, human herpes virus 8. Uh, so the question might give you a patient who has HIV, they show you violaceous skin lesions, you're thinking, okay, easy, Kaposi sarcoma, and then you're looking for human herpes virus 8 as the answer, but you notice all the answers are just bacteria, and you're like, hmm, what the fuck? That's weird. Barnella hensley, it's bacillary angiomatosis, okay? Pastoral multicida, the only uh, detail you need to know is that this will cause infection, cutaneous infection, uh, due to cat and dog bites, whereas Bartonella hensley, cat and dog scratches. So Treponema pallidum causes syphilis, very high yield for Yosemite, can be a very lengthy discussion. Syphilis is a spirochete, which refers to coil-shaped bacteria that can be visualized with dark field microscopy. Now, primary syphilis will present as a painless genital lesion, referred to as a canker. Painless, very high yield. If it's painful, that can, that can be cankeroid. And uh, U.S. Simile also likes to uh, distract you with cankeroid when in reality it, it's, it's HSV 1 or 2, okay? So HSV and cankeroid are painful, but syphilis, canker, is painless. Now, the canker can go away on its own over generally six weeks, and then we can have a latency period with no outward pathology, followed by reemergence of secondary syphilis weeks to months later, which will classically cause a palms and soles rash and a maculopapular body rash, and also painless genital plaques, referred to as condylomata lata. The palms and soles rashes are very high yield for Yosemite, so not just secondary syphilis, but also, of course, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, rickettsia rickettsi. It can also be uh, Coxsackie A virus, causing hand, foot, mouth disease. We can have other causes, such as Kawasaki's. So for Yosemite, just know palms and soles rash, secondary syphilis, very high yield. Tertiary syphilis will present as gumas, which will look like cankers, but rather than on the genitals, they'll be in locations such as the face, okay? So they might show you uh, a guy who has one on his nose, and they tell you biopsy shows plasma cell infiltration with a vasculitis. That is a very difficult pathologic descriptor for tertiary syphilis, okay? Plasma cell infiltration with vasculitis. Neonatal syphilis, of course, we could do a long discussion on our torches infections, but saber shins, saddle nose, teeth abnormalities, very high yield. I've seen questions that are difficult, but they mention the tooth abnormalities, and you're like, okay, that's syphilis, okay? So Hutchinson incisors, Hutchinson molars, mulberry teeth, neurosyphilis. So Argyle Robertson pupil is known colloquially as prostitute's pupil. The Pupil will accommodate but not react. So it changes in response to the pupillary size will change in response to distance of an object from the eye, but it does not react to changes in light. Okay, so uh, accommodates but does not react. Do not confuse Argyle Robertson pupil with Marcus Gunn pupil, which is relative afferent pupillary defect, which is optic neuritis and multiple sclerosis. Tabes dorsalis, that's going to be obliteration of our dorsal columns of the spinal cord, leading to loss of vibration and proprioception. Charcot joints are neurogenic joints, which are uh, joint abnormalities, whether we have uh, erosion of the actual skin or whether we have disorganization of the uh, bony structure of the joint itself that occurs due to loss of sensation. So neurosyphilis and diabetes are two high-yield causes for Yosemite. And then just some buzzy descriptors, such as wide-based gait or stroke without hypertension in a younger sexually active patient. And you're reading the question, you're like, hmm, what the fuck? They're just talking about neurosyphilis, okay? They're buzzy. As I just said before, dark field microscopy for visualization of biopsy of a canker. Uh, for the tertiary, when we do the biopsy of the guma, we can see the plasma cell infiltration with vasculitis. For secondary syphilis and later, we can do serology to diagnose. So USMLE wants you to know VDRL, RPR, uh, there are two screening tests for syphilis. 
They're sensitive but not specific. We can get false positives in lupus, which I'll talk about in a moment. A uh, fluorescent treponema antibody is confirmatory. So they might give you a patient who has SLE and they tell you the VDRL is positive and they just want you to know that factoid, that uh, anti uh, or that lupus anticoagulant is an antibody against phospholipid that you can get a high APTT, okay, in terms of our coagulation cascade, but we get in vivo thromboses. Uh, but that patients with SLE can get a false positive VDRL test. And the VDRL is described as a test uh, that is performed using charcoal particles. I've seen that on NVME exam. And we treat with penicillin. Okay, it's an easy point, but you need to know that in order to pass USMLE as a baseline. You treat penicillin or you treat syphilis with penicillin. And for pregnant women and those who have secondary syphilis or later, you must if they have history of anaphylaxis to penicillin, you must desensitize and give penicillin, okay? So for instance, if we have another condition like uh, where a patient has an allergy to a beta-lactam, we could use many alternative agents. However, syphilis, penicillin is so efficacious for the condition that we really wanna use penicillin. Syphilis, very severe condition. So. We, de we desensitize, uh, giving small amounts of penicillin subcutaneously, and then we administer full-dose penicillin for the condition. jarish herxheimer reaction. This can be an anaphylaxis-like response after you treat with penicillin for syphilis, where the spirochetes, you'll get lysis of the, the cells with release of bacterial products into the blood. It's on the NBME exam. Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi, okay, so it's spread by Ixodes tick, very high yield. Yosemite wants you to know that Ixodes tick will spread not just Borrelia burgdorferi for Lyme disease, but also Borrelia recurrentis, which uh, causes recurrent fever. I will talk about that in a moment, as well as Ehrlichia chaffinsis, uh, which uh, it causes a Lyme disease-like presentation, and also anaplasma. So Lyme disease, of course, our erythema chronica migrans, our target rash, and Bell's palsy. These are super high yield presentations for USMLE. Some students will get pedantic about which stage of Lyme disease we're going to see which presentation. USMLE doesn't really ask questions like that. They might give you a question where they show you in a picture of an eight-year-old boy uh, where he's got a Bell palsy, and then a second picture right next to it where you see the circular rash on his arm. And the answer is you give doxycycline if he's age nine or older, and you give amoxicillin if he's eight or younger. And for pregnant women, we give amoxicillin for Lyme disease. So as I just fucking said, uh, the treatment is doxy, but if pregnant or eight or younger, we give amoxicillin. Now, USMLE is not going to force you into position where you have to choose ceftriaxone or amoxicillin for the alternative agent. They'll give you one or the other. So they might say a pregnant woman has a target rash, and then they'll list choice A, doxycycline, like choice E, ceftriaxone, amoxicillin's not listed, and you're just going to choose ceftriaxone because we don't give doxy during pregnancy. Now, prophy prophy prophylaxis is not indicated unless there's evidence of a tick having been attached for greater than 36 hours in asymptomatic patients, okay? That's a that's an important question that can occasionally show up where they just say a tick was found uh, and then it was quickly removed and you do not have to give any type of prophylaxis. And it, it, it only applies to endemic areas, by the way. So if you're if you're living in a state that uh, has high uh, has high frequency of Lyme disease cases, that's when prophylaxis is considered in asymptomatic patients. Borrelia recurrentis, as I just said, causes relapsing fever, uh, not to be confused with brucella, which is undulant fever. Just be aware that there are two causes of fever. Leptospira enterogens causes a flu-like illness in a farmer who's been exposed to animal urine. What USM And they want you to know it's ice pick shaped, okay? Now what USMLE is going to do is, for instance, give you an easy presentation of syphilis. They might give you a painless canker in a sexually transmitted uh, younger patient. And then they say, the most likely causal organism, of course being syphilis, the most likely causal organism is most taxonomically and morphologically similar to which other organism? And they'll list 
leptospira as an answer, okay? So that's one way they like to ask this. And of course, uh, Borrelia for, for Lyme disease could also be a correct answer. Mycobacterium tuberculosis, lengthy discussion. It is difficult to stain so we on gram stain, so we require a special stain, acid fast. It produces cord factor as a virulence factor. This is on the new NBME exams for step one. So it's weird, okay, but you should just memorize that factoid. It causes caseating granulomas. So most conditions that cause granulomas, uh, usually autoimmune diseases, like sarcoidosis or Crohn disease, they're non-caseating. Or we might get uh, non-caseating granulomas in borreliosis, a pneumoconiosis, and we can get granulomata, as I talked about before, uh, with Barnella henselae for cat scratch disease, but they're non-caseating. Caseating refers to TB and also systemic fungi. And TB questions can present with B symptoms. So night sweats, fever, weight loss in a patient who has a pulmonary condition, okay? It can sound like lung cancer, but uh, it's TB uh, much of the time, depending on the patient, of course, immigrant status, etc., which I will talk about in a moment. So there you go, immigrant status. So you have to be mindful of your demographics and what uh, other information they're supplying in the vignette. Be aware that a miliary presentation disseminated, we can get unusual TB uh, pathologies such as psoas, abscess, it can affect the vertebral column, pot disease, we can get adrenal insufficiency, okay, which can present similar to disseminated histoplasmosis. 2CK wants you to know all about PPD testing, so let's, I'll talk about that right now. So the first test you're going to diagnose, uh, use to diagnose TB is the PPD skin test, the Montau test. It's a type 4 hypersensitivity, that detail obviously important for step 1, so it's a T-cell response. And if the PPD test is negative, you're going to repeat in 1 to 2 weeks. If it's positive, we never repeat. I should mention, because I, I didn't mention it in this, slide, in, in this presentation, increased susceptibility to tuberculosis infections uh, can occur in patients who have IL-12 receptor deficiency, or IFN gamma receptor deficiency. Sounds nitpicky, sounds low yield. I'm mentioning it because it's on the NBME exams and I happen to not have written it in this presentation here. So going back, our PPD test, you're never gonna repeat if it's positive. Now, in terms of the, in, the degree of induration, what's, a po what's considered a positive test? <clears throat> For 2CK, if they mention a patient who has HIV AIDS, immunocompromised, let's say they're on chronic steroids for an autoimmune disease, let's say they're on immunosuppressant therapy because they're an organ transplant recipient, or they have calcifications visualized on chest, chest x-ray consistent with tuberculosis, or they've had recent contact, recent confirmed contact with someone who has active TB, we consider five plus millimeters positive. 10 plus millimeters is positive for prisoners, prison workers, healthcare workers, and also immigrant status from endemic areas such as Albania or rural India. I've seen those two locations on uh, NBME questions. Also TB laboratory personnel and children under the age of four. Everyone else is greater than 15 millimeters for positivity. Erythema does not count, okay? It's the induration, which is the actual swelling of the area that counts. History of the BCG vaccine, the live attenuated vaccine for TB, does not change our management. That's really important. So if they say a guy comes in from rural India and he has history of BCG vaccine and he's got a 17 millimeters in duration on the PPD test, the answer is we will manage him as though he's never had the BCG test, or sorry, the BCG test, the BCG vaccine. So now management, okay, more 2CK stuff. I know many of you guys are studying for step one, but look, your 2CK score is going to fucking matter. I'm telling you the high yield points right now, and this is really important for you, okay? So uh, the PPD test, as I said, we do that first. If positive, we do chest x-ray, okay? So if positive PPD, the negative chest x-ray, answer equals treat for latent TB, which is the same thing as TB prophylaxis. And that's going to be isoniazid for nine months plus vitamin B6 because INH, which is isoniazid, can cause B6 deficiency. If we have the positive PPD followed by positive chest x-ray, that's treat for active TB, 
which is going to be ripe for two months, uh, rifampinicinize it, pyrazinamide, ethambutol, and then rifampinicinize it alone for four more months, okay? So that's more 2CK level. Drug side effects are fair game for both steps. We're not going to spend 10 minutes on that right now, but you could be aware that rifampin causes orange-red secretions. They're benign. Uh, RIP, rifampin isoniazid pyrazinamide, all cause hepatotoxicity. Uh, rifampin induces P450. INH inhibits P450. Uh, isoniazid can also cause a high anion gap, metabolic acidosis. It's, it's one of the, it's the eye in mud piles along with uh, iron tablets. And uh, ethambutol, high yield for visual disturbance, okay? Central scotoma, red-green color blindness, etc. So mycobacterium avium intracellulare, MAI, classically HIV, AIDS patients with CD4 under 50. We used to give azithromycin prophylaxis. We don't anymore uh, based on the new guidelines. MAI infections can also cause pulmonary disease, a pulmonary infection in older white women. It's referred to as Lady Windermere syndrome. USMLE doesn't need you to know the eponymous name, but I've seen an MAI infection, an MAI infection in an older white woman on USMLE before, and I was like, wow, that's fucking Lady Windermere syndrome. There you go, okay? And also, this is really fucking weird. Uh, it can cause a violaceous nodule, cervical lymphadenitis on the neck in a child. That's being assessed in USMLE. Mycobacterium marinum, this is one of the most underrated organisms for USMLE, meaning most of you watching this presentation have never fucking heard of it before, but it's super high yield on the exam and I've had students get it, which is a red lesion on the finger or wrist of a child or adult who has gone to a water park or aquarium, okay? So child goes to SeaWorld, child goes to an aquarium, has a red lesion on the finger, answer, My Mycobacterium marium, marinum. 39-year-old woman, she works at an aquarium, red lesion on the finger, answer, mycobacterium marinum, not pseudomonas, okay? Leprosy, so mycobacterium leprae, tuberculoid versus lepromatous or lepromatous. Uh, tuberculoid tends to occur in patients who have a better immune system, more of a Th1 response. Lepromatous tends to occur in those who are more immunocompromised. <clears throat> it's more of a Th2 response. Leprosy can cause nodular uh, skin lesions and also nodular appearance of the hands and loss of sensation, hypoesthesia. Super high yield detail for USMLE is that it grows better at lower temperatures, okay? That's why it likes to affect the tip of the nose and also the hands. So mycoplasma pneumoniae, not mycobacterium, mycoplasma causes atypical walking pneumonia. This refers to a chest x-ray that will look pretty shitty. You see bilateral infiltrates. The patient has a fever of 101, but the patient's walking around as if he or she is otherwise fine, okay? So they call that walking pneumonia. So same as with Legionella before, which I talked about, atypical pneumonia uh, on USMLE, they, they will imply that by saying, interstitial infiltrates, okay? So I write here that the word interstitial wins over the pneumonia location. Let's say they give you 23-year-old male, a fever of 102, right lower lobe consolidation with dullness to percussion. What's the most likely causal organism? Answer, strep pneumo, okay? Most common cause of low bar pneumonia. Next question, 23-year-old male, a fever 101, uh, Bilateral interstitial infiltrates. Most likely organism? Answer, mycoplasma. Next question. 23-year-old male, fever 101, right lower lobe infiltrate, right lower lobe consolidation with interstitial infiltrates seen on chest x-ray. Answer, mycoplasma. And strep pneumo won't be listed. And you're like, hmm, I thought atypical pneumonia was bilateral interstitial infiltrates. It usually is. But the word interstitial wins over location. Okay, so I've seen that in a 2CK level IM question. That's quite difficult. And you also need to know that uh, mycoplasma can cause positive cold agglutinins, which are IgM antibodies against RBCs. So it can cause a cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Very fucking high yield for USMLE. They want you to know mycoplasma does not have a peptidoglycan cell wall. That in and of itself, very high yield. And then they'll also ask you in other questions, 
well, why can't you treat a uh, mycoplasma with amoxicillin slash beta-lactam? And the answer is it doesn't have peptidoglycan. It doesn't have a peptidoglycan cell wall. Now we've got some chlamydia organisms here, various ones. Uh, chlamydia pneumoniae is not the STD. Chlamydia pneumoniae is a cause of atypical pneumonia similar to mycoplasma, Legionella. Chlamydia cetaci is an atypical pneumonia uh, that can be contracted from birds, a uh, bird owner, pet shop owner. Now, chlamydia trachomatis, D through K is our STD, okay? So uh, standard uh, penile vaginal discharge, pelvic inflammatory disease, where no organisms are grown uh, from the discharge, that's classically chlamydia. I've talked about a lot of stuff in my other presentations, how gonorrhea, they will tell you gram-negative diplococci. Chlamydia, D through, uh, trachomatis D through K can cause reactive arthritis. So of course your urethritis, uh, or yeah, so usually a urethritis, your polyarthritis, and then I-itis colloquially, which can be conjunctivitis, anterior uveitis, episcleritis. So that's our triad for reactive arthritis. Gonococcus doesn't cause reactive arthritis, it's a unique gonococcal arthritis, as I talked about in my other presentation. And also ophthalmia neonatorum, so neonatal conjunctivitis uh, can be caused by, cl by chlamydia trachomatis. A through C causing trachoma and L1 through L3 causing lymphogranuloma venarium, lower yield for USMLE, but you should just be aware. Trachoma is roughness of the backs of the eyelids, causes blindness in usually in Africa. L1 through L3 can cause anal uh, lymphadenopathy, causing difficulty with defecation. Okay. I already talked about STIs with chlamydia. So rickettsial infections. Rickettsia, an obscure term. It refers to a highly pleomorphic, takes on many shapes uh, of intracellular bacteria, but mo mostly rod-like. And rickettsia, rickettsia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, uh, spread by dermacenter wood tick. It's not Ixodes tick. That's the key. If you were to look up Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you'll see that there are actually multiple ticks, like the American tick, American wood tick. There are other ticks that can cause it, that can spread it, but it's not Ixodes tick. We said Ixodes was Lyme disease and also Ehrlichia chaffensis, anaplasma, and also Babesia, I should mention. So uh, Rickettsia, Rickettsia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Palms and Souls Rash, okay? We talked about how uh, also important causes, secondary syphilis, Kawasaki A for hand, foot, mouth disease, and even Kawasaki, all right? And more difficult questions can give you a rash starting on the wrists and ankles, and it moves inward. So I've seen questions where it's not mandatory, that the rash is palms and soles, it's more that it starts distally and it moves inward, okay? It's a centripetal rash. Now, this gets a little bit uh, debatable, but this is what the literature says. We treat Rocky Mountain spotted fever with doxy, okay? Even in pregnant women and children under the age of eight, okay? Rocky Mountain spotted fever, it's what the literature wants. It's not my fucking opinion, okay? It's what CDC guidelines say at the moment in 2021. Whereas for Lyme disease, we said, do not give doxy to pregnant women. Do not give doxy to children eight or younger. We'd give amoxicillin or ceftriaxone, okay? Coxiella brunetti, another obscure organism. This causes Q fever, okay? And it's caused by uh, exposure to cattle. So Q fever. Now this is uh, quite weird, but it'll show up if you ever get a Coxiella Bernetti question. They'll tell you that uh, there's an ammonia in someone who's worked with farm animals and that there is no reactivity with Proteus O antigen. And you're like, hmm, no fucking idea what that means. They're telling you it's a negative wheel Felix test. It's just a detail they like for Coxiella Bernetti, okay? Whereas the other Rickettsial infections like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, if you were to take the patient's serum, he or she will develop antibodies, not just against Rickettsia rickettsii, but also against Proteus O antigen, molecular mimicry, okay? It's weird. So we're just going to go through some questions here, all right? Uh, we could do 50 questions. We're just going to do a few. So 54-year-old woman, she went on a recent, went to a recent business conference, Fever 101, bilateral interstitial infiltrates on chest x-ray and diarrhea. What's the most likely causal organism? This is just simply Legionella, Okay. Uh, we don't need to be fancy. It's just a high yield point you need to know that Legionella can cause hyponatremia and diarrhea in addition to pneumonia and that going to conferences, air conditioners, aerosols, those are buzzy descriptors.
23-year-old male went hiking a few days ago as a fever of 101. Chest x-ray shows bilateral interstitial infiltrates. Cold agglutinins are positive. Q asks why amoxicillin cannot be used to treat this patient. So what's our diagnosis? It's mycoplasma pneumoniae. We said that it's the most common cause, it's the most bac common bacterial cause of atypical pneumonia, and it can cause IgM antibodies against RBCs, okay, cold agglutinins. Why can't we use amoxicillin slash beta-lactams? Because mycoplasma does not have a peptidoglycan cell wall. Seven-year-old girl, papule on the finger, biopsy of lesion with silver stain shows granulomata. What's the most likely diagnosis? This is cat scratch disease, Bartonella henselae. We said that the question can be more difficult, doesn't have to mention actual scratch, and they can just say granulomata with silver stain uh, with a papule. And do not confuse this, of course, with Pastorella multocida, which is due to cat and dog bites. 24-year-old male, maculopapular rash in his back, plus palms and soles. What's the most appropriate treatment for this condition? Uh, this, of course, is secondary syphilis, important cause of palms and soles rash and we treat with penicillin. And we said that if there is history of anaphylaxis to penicillin slash beta-lactam, we're just gonna desensitize and give penicillin. The USMLE, another way they can ask this, is they'll show you the back of a male who's let's say 24, and you can see a maculopapular rash. They said he's been having uh, intercourse without condom use, and they tell you in the question that antifungals were not effective, or they say KOH prep is negative, and they say, what's the next best step in diagnosis? And the answer will be uh, VDRL, RPR. We said that's the screening test for syphilis, as well as a fluorescent treponema antibody, which is confirmatory, okay? And we said charcoal particles is a way that they can describe the VDRL test, false positives and syphilis. 39-year-old female works at an aquarium. She's got a red painful lesion on her finger. What's the diagnosis? Answer equals mycobacterium marinum. Okay, aquarium slash water parks. 28 year old female, 12 weeks gestation. She recently found a tick attached to her hip. Target rash visualized in the area. What's the most appropriate treatment? We said this is Lyme disease. We said that in Lyme disease, we do not give doxycycline to pregnant women or children eight or younger. The answer here would be amoxicillin or ceftriaxone. Both are safe during pregnancy. The USMLE will not give you both. Uh, for as answer choices to the same question, okay? So amoxicillin or ceftriaxone. And then in contrast, rickettsia, rickettsia, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, we give doxycycline even to pregnant women and to kids eight or younger. And that's it for this presentation, okay? So as I said at the beginning, we could do a two-hour discussion and talk about every little detail about every little organism, but the point is not to entertain and be superfluous. The point is to increase your score as much as possible in the least amount of time possible. So you know the deal. I'm going to continue making more content. If you like my stuff, subscribe to my channel and I appreciate your time. That's it.